Well, hey everybody, it is great to see you today. Welcome to Living Power, your online Bible study where we're walking through the Bible in a year. Today is August 27th and we are reading the book of Lamentations today. The first chapter was in yesterday's reading, but I do, if I can, like to talk about the whole book all at once. And so I'm going to talk to you today about Lamentations as a whole. So we're going to cover chapter one from yesterday and of course all of today's reading. It is a, um, an emotional book. It is written by, believed to have been written by Jeremiah, and it speaks to the time in history that we're studying. What we've been looking at over the past couple of um, days, certainly, and maybe even weeks, is the Babylonian conquering of Jerusalem. And we have discussed that there were, were three sieges, and this third one, this third siege, is a double whammy. It included not only exile, but the destruction of the temple and the palaces, and the carting off of the priestly tools that were used for sacrifices, all of the articles that were designed and crafted back um, in Moses' day, and this is pretty significant. All of those articles, incidentally, were carted back to Babylon. And when we get to the book of Daniel, a little bit further into that book, you'll remember there was a time where, this is future, we haven't read about this yet, but Nebuchadnezzar sees a hand writing on the wall, and it's, of course, a prediction of his downfall, but Daniel... Um, is not part of this big party that they're having. And the party, during the party that they're having, they're actually using some of these articles that were taken from the temple as their party articles. They were just drinking out of the cups and using the forks and the spoons. Of course, they were of such value that, um, you know, to the Babylonians, they didn't see how uh, consecrated and sacred they were. So um, just I just wanted you, for those of you that were familiar with that story about Daniel and the and the party and the handwriting on the wall and everything, you don't you don't have to know that yet because we haven't read that yet. But go back for those of you that are familiar with that. This is the time that those articles that they used at that party were stolen from the temple. Now, what's actually happening in Jerusalem? You know, this is a story that we read in the Bible, and we think, oh, how, how awful. But do we really, really think, oh, how awful? I mean, this is a situation that we in America, we cannot, we don't have anything to compare this to. And what's happening is that the walls of the city have been torn down. They're, the city now has no protection whatsoever. The temple has been burned, and the uh, Gentiles have walked in, have desecrated the temple, and they've stolen the treasury pieces. The palace has been ransacked and burned. The people, many of them have been killed. Many have been exiled. Only the poor, the widowed, the um, elderly are left behind. You have to think of it this way. Everything in the city of value has been destroyed. And think about when you look around. Uh, remember that movie Independence Day with Will Smith? In, and after um, you know the aliens came in and you just looked around and there was just, I mean, nothing left. That's kind of how this was. And there are people literally dead in the streets, men, women, and children. It's, it's just awful. Now, why is this significant to Israel? Let's get into some of the um, significance of this event. First of all, after this event, it completely stopped their festivals. Remember, they had three annual festivals, and the people from all over Israel would pilgrim pilgrimage into Jerusalem for these festivals. And they traveled three times a year to do that. Well, after this, you know, those were n no more. It stopped the sacrifices. And, you know, to this day, in this day, this year that we're in, I mean, that's, they're not having sacrifices. They're not doing pilgrimages. That's, um, this is how that happened. And the, the law, in verse 9, it says the law is very hard to follow. So I think I'm in chapter 1. Let me see if I am. I think I am in chapter 1. So this would be from yesterday's reading. Now, Lamentations as a book, as a whole, 
was written by Jeremiah, and it means to lament, be sorrowful, sorrowful over what has happened. They're sorrowed over the city, over the temple, over the people. And, you know, this book, Lamentations, has been read as liturgy in Jewish services annually to commemorate this destruction of the temple. And I've even heard that it has been read on Good Friday in Christian churches. You know, I had mentioned before that it really expresses the emotion people are feeling as we're reading about these events in 2 Kings. So try not to just kind of gloss over lamentations. Really try to understand the, the emotions and the feelings that these people um, are going through and try to have empathy as we read this and, and see what it would have been, been like. You know, interesting that the people felt that Jerusalem was safe because the temple was there. And these are uh, these mm, verses are kind of interwoven in Lamentations and in the history books, and you have to be real careful to find them. If we go to Lamentations 4, verse 12, let's just skip over there right now. I will read you a verse that is very telling. It says, Not a king in all the world, no one in all the world, oh, not a king in all the earth, no one in all the world would have believed that an enemy could march through the gates of Jerusalem. There it is in 412. This is why it was such a shock to the people. And, you know, we were shocked in this country at 9-11. Literally shocked. We will never forget where we were when we heard of the terrible destruction of the Twin Towers. These people in Jerusalem were shocked just like we were. And I put in my Bible on 412 there, America, because we have this, hopefully not as much today as we did prior to 9-11, but had this um, false sense of security, you know, that no one could come in, that we were protected. And I just think it's a very good reminder here, here it is in the Bible, that we trust in the Lord, we don't trust in princes or leaders our military, but we have to be obedient to the Lord because He is our true protection. And I found a quote, a quote that I th thought you would like in one of the commentaries, and it says, God does not hold stones in higher regard than obedience. Disobedience brings destruction. And of course, he was referring to the stones as being the temple. The Jews placed their confidence in the temple because it was there. Kind of like we in America um, place our high, high regard in our military and our might. Here's something else to think about. There is a uh, plea in Lamentations to judge the nations for doing this to Israel. And God said yes, that he would do that. He will judge the nations. Even though, you know, th this is how God works. In his sovereignty and in his justice, he uses the nation of Babylon to come and judge and punish um, and chastise Israel, ultimately, for their restoration to him. But he has to, and he will, in his justice, come against the nation of Babylon for their role in it. And I know that seems kind of odd, but God is a God of justice, and he, he makes sure that justice is served wherever there is injustice. So in Lamentations, we see a call to a save the date, if you will, because the, the date that he will judge the nations for this is in the tribulation period, the day of the Lord that we've been talking about, and we've not, um, we've not experienced that in our history yet. So we are still under the time of this save the date, which I thought was pretty interesting. Now, if you were living through this time in Jerusalem, let's pretend for just a minute, what would your life be like? Well, if you were not exiled, and just think about how terrible that would be to be kicked out of your home. Some people were separated for their, from their families. But let's assume that we were of the people that were left behind. There would be tremendous famine. Uh, there would be uh, crops destroyed. There would be uh, lack of food. And it was so bad that people were bartering their stuff for their food. And if you had rations of any kind, um, in Atlanta we had a, um, 
we had, I think it was a snowstorm last year. We're not used to that. And it snowed for maybe two or three days. No, it snowed for a day, but it got so cold that there was ice all over the road. Well, I went to the grocery store after four days, and thank goodness my dad had a truck. and He was able to drive me there, so we were able to get a couple things. But I was shocked. We The city had been shut down for multiple days, and... I was shocked because the shelves were empty, empty, empty. And I remember we said to each other, boy, if we ever had a really bad storm, we would not be prepared. And, you know, it's interesting that the people were bartering stuff for food. It was really bad. So throw materialism out the window. You know, we were just reading a couple weeks ago about how the women were you know, proud of their scarves and their jewelry and their painted nails and their little flippy shoes and all the clothes and everything that they had. And now we see a totally different picture. You talk about turnaround. Now we see them with nothing. And it is so bad. I want to warn you what I'm about to say because it's gross, but we need to say it. They were eating their own children. And you think, how in the world can they eat their own children? Look at Lamentations 2.20 and look at Lamentations 4.10. It's there twice. It's repeated. And I, I went back into Leviticus. Leviticus is the Old Testament book that we read back in February. And this is where the blessings and the curses were spelled out for the people. So we think these blessings and curses were irrelevant. A lot of people, when they read the Bible, skip over that. Don't do that. This is so, so, so important. I want to read you Leviticus with the Lamentations that we're reading today so that you can see God's fulfillment of prophecy. What he said would happen is happening in a nutshell. Let me read Leviticus 26, verse 23. And if you fail to learn the lesson and continue your hostility toward me, now remember, this is under Moses. This is what he's saying under Moses. Then I myself will be hostile towards you. I will personally strike you with calamity seven times over for your sins. I will send armies against you to carry out the curse of the covenant you have broken. That was Babylon and Assyria, right? And then it says, in, I'm in verse 27, In spite of all this, if you refuse to listen, etc., etc., I will vent my full hostility. I will punish you seven times over. Verse 29, Then you will eat the flesh of your own sons and daughters. There it is in Leviticus. And here we're seeing the fulfillment of that. This is what the people were actually having to do. I mean, it is... Now, these were not bad mothers. I do not believe these were bad people. This is utterly, total depravity and desperation. They had absolutely nothing else that they could do. I mean, it's, it's just awful. And Lamentations 2.20 is the verse that I put here um, beside this. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 29. Now, let's move on past that because that's really awful. Your life would also be different in that your priests are gone, your king is gone, your nation is gone, there are no more festivals, you didn't have a Bible to begin with, but it was very hard. Now it's almost impossible to follow the law. You don't have anyone speaking to you about that. And um, it was just a terrible time. Now here's one more question. Who did all this? God says in his word that he brought all of this and in Lamentations 2.8, I find it utterly amazing. It says he made careful plans when he planned out the destruction of the temple. It was certainly not something that he wanted to do. He took no pleasure in any of this. He wanted to bless his people. And that's why he spelled out so carefully, you know, do, do this, be obedient to me, follow my law, and I will bestow all of these blessings on you. Well, the people did not do that. And God is simply fulfilling everything he said would happen hundreds of years before in the time of Moses. He is giving the land its Sabbath. This is very important because the people did not follow. This was yet another requirement that they did not follow, that every seven years they were supposed to let the land rest. And they were supposed to just eat off of the 
<clears throat> the um, produce that the land produced, but they weren't supposed to till the land and all that. They were supposed to give the land its Sabbath rest. Well, there are two places in Scripture that it says if you don't give the land its Sabbath rest, then um, ultimately a curse will be brought upon you for that. That's in Leviticus 26, 34, and 35. And in Second Chronicles, which was yesterday's reading, Second Chronicles 36, 21, God explains that the reason for the exile had to last 70 years in Babylon is because it's one, one year for every seven years because it had been 490 years that they had not honored the Sabbath rest. This just makes me believe that the Sabbath, making it a holy day in our life, is just extremely important. And I'm convicted personally through this study to honor the Sabbath more in my home. Chapter 3 in Lamentations is the heart of the book. This is where we find a glimmer of hope. It's all of a sudden switched to first person, and it's talking ab about Jeremiah and Jerusalem, of course. It's probably not referring to Jesus because so many of the things that happened to Jeremiah did not exactly happen to Jesus in that way. But in chapter 3, I want to leave you with this. There is a glimmer of hope. All is not lost. And Jeremiah tells us, starting in verse 19, I am grieving, however, I remember this. In the midst of my misery, in the midst of my, in my troubles and suffering, I remember, I'm in verse 22, chapter 3, the faithful love of the Lord, this is his hesed, H-E-S-E-D, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is thy faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I hope in him. And jumping ahead in verse 57, it says, you came when I called. And you, God, told me, do not fear. That is the promise for today. That is the love of God expressed to us generations since. And these timeless words are still true for us as well. In the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our misery, whatever it is we are dealing with, and we all have things that we're currently dealing with, whatever it is, hear God's message to you today that His love is faithful, it is everlasting, that His mercies are new each morning, and that as long as we stay close to Him, well-grounded, in scripture, and most importantly, in relationship with him. We really have nothing to fear, for he is sovereign over our circumstances. Well, that's all we have time for today. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson today. Can't wait to see you again tomorrow. Blessings to you and your family. Shalom.